All right, so before I start, uh, I want to ask you guys a question, and, and I want us to be honest with ourselves. Uh, I don't only think that it's important that we're honest with ourselves. I think to not be so is dangerous. And, and, and I, when I ask the question, I, I'm not going to ask it to offend. Uh, I love you guys genuinely. I really do. Uh, but I don't want us to just shrug it off either, right? All right. You ready? Are we committed to the Lord, or are you just a fan? Now, what do I mean by that, right? I am a fan of a football team, as, as many of you are, Miss Joy. I have a team that I root for, but I'm not committed to them. I don't show up constantly and continually looking to help the team. I'm not showing up, seeing if I can help take care of the coaches or the players or the administrators. I'm not committed to giving up a, a large piece of myself or my time or the first pieces of my resources. I'm a fan. I want them to do well, but I'm not going to commit myself to make sure they do. Does that make sense? That's somebody else's job for the, to make sure the team does good, right? That's the coach's job. That's the player's job. Well, many churchgoers have the same opinion on church as well. That's somebody else's job. Not specifically this church, but church as a whole, okay? Uh, as well as the work of the church that countless brothers and sisters through history have sacrificed and bled and died so that you can sit here today and hear what Jesus has done for you. So this morning we're going to look at, uh, and we're going to take a little bit of a detour uh, I know, and generally, uh, we, we're a very uh, you know, expository church, meaning that you know, we will, for the most part, pick a Bible, or pick a Bible. We only have one, one Bible. <laughs> uh, but we'll pick a book out of the Bible, and, and we'll go through that entire book, verse by verse by verse. Uh, Tim is in Corinthians right now, and instead of me trying to pick up where he is, I'm just going to give you a little bit of something extra, and then we can come back to Corinthians when he's back next week. Uh, if you want to see expository from me, you'd have to be here on a Wednesday night, and we just started James, and we'll talk about that later too, but uh, um, so we're, we're going to take a detour, and, and we're going to look at Paul today. Um, we're going to look at the conversion of the Apostle Paul and about the man himself. Paul is the inspired author of 13 of the books in the New Testament. He was an expert in the law. He is a model of ministry. And his writings are a great teacher of theology. His conversion was one of the great stories of human history. Pastor John MacArthur, any of you guys ever heard of John MacArthur before? If not, look him up, he's great. Uh, Pastor John MacArthur says, uh, so great was his conversion that it's a reoccurring focal point of the whole book of Acts. We see it in Acts 9 and the retelling of it in Acts 22 and descriptions of it in Acts 26. Uh, and, and everything that leads up to it in Acts uh, 7 and 8. MacArthur describes Paul as, by birth, a Jew, by conviction, a Pharisee, by citizenship, a Roman, by education, a Greek, and by grace, a Christian. But in all of it, fully committed. Before we get to our text today in Acts 9, uh, we, we first find Paul back in Acts 7 where a servant of the Lord named Stephen had given a historic sermon that pointed the writings and the prophecies of the Old Testament toward Jesus and concluded his speech by calling those that were present stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, he says, because you resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. And then Stephen goes on to say, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. After hearing these things, the Jews rushed on him and began stoning him to death. Not a big surprise. The Jews got offended easily, especially when it came to Christ. As do, do, as, do as does, as does most of the world. The, the name of Jesus can provoke more emotion, regardless of your stance on it, than any other name in the world. 
If you're a Christian, it brings forth very strong emotions. If you're atheist, it brings forth very strong emotions. If you're Muslim, if you're whatever, the name of Jesus will bring extremely strong emotions. And that's what happens here. So at hearing these things, the Jews rushed in on him and began to stone him to death. Now before casting the stones down on Stephen, though, it says in verse 58 of chapter 7, that they all laid their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul, indicating that Saul was likely the Jewish authority present. And in the next chapter, chapter 8, verse 1, Luke confirms Saul approved of Stephen's execution. Uh, and then, so back to, to Wednesday nights. We're, we're studying uh, the book of James. We just started the, the book of James this last Wednesday. I think we made it to verse 4, I think. Um, in it, James opens his letter with an introduction and describes himself as a bondservant and gives greetings to the 12 tribes in dispersion. Dispersion is not a place. It means that the, the church at that time had been scattered to great distances because of constant and violent persecution. Chief among those persecutors was Saul. Saul witnessed the stoning of a bloody Stephen, looking up into heaven and seeing the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And as they were stoning Stephen to death, he called out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. If you were being stoned to death, do you think that's something you would say? Hey, stop it, you jerks. No, but, I mean, that's the... That, that, that's the that's the, that's the right heart. So hopefully none of us ever get stoned to death. If we do, hopefully we have a heart enough of Christ to be able to pray for those that persecute us. We are called to do so. In the book of Matthew, right, Jesus tells us, pray for those that hate you. It's hard to do. But it's what we're called to do. So even before Saul sees Jesus himself, I believe Saul, seeing Stephen see Jesus, left a mark. Saul was about to be put on a path that would see him walk away from an incredibly powerful career, one where he studied under the great rabbi Gamaliel in Jerusalem. Uh, this very famous rabbi was known as the beauty of the law because of his mastery of it. Saul eventually found himself quickly rising in reputation and authority and Paul himself, uh, very strongly in, in Philippians 3, lays out a bit of his resume where he says, and know this about Paul, um, the man did not struggle for confidence. Okay? Uh, he, he, had, he, had, uh, he had issues, we all have issues, but confidence was not one that, that Paul struggled with. So uh, this, this is his own words from Philippians 3 where he says, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. And with all of that backing him up and the authority given to him, Luke says he laid waste to the church. Paul himself describes his actions uh, like this in, in Acts 26. He says, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in, in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I pushed them often, in all, or punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in a raging fury against them, I persecuted them, even to foreign cities. So in Paul's own words, he talks about the persecution that he set forth with the church. So now we're going to pick up our text this morning in Acts 9. Um, though much of the church had already been scattered, uh, he now sets off to hunt them down. So that's where we're going to pick up verse 1, Acts 9. But Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. 
Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. And the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. And Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate or drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here am I, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. At the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine and the children, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight, and filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. Then verse 20 says, and immediately... He began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And when many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. So the man that had persecuted the church with such great zeal now immediately begins to preach, Jesus is the Son of God. And the response was, well, now he has to be persecuted, right? So that there's a lot here, and we're going to try to unpack uh, some of this together. Uh, verse 1 says that Paul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. This is a picture of a violent, angry man, convinced of his own righteousness, focused and driving destruction down upon the church. He was committed to tearing it all down. And he was headed to the ancient city of Damascus. Uh, so for those that don't know, Damascus uh, was about 150 miles north of Jerusalem. Um, Depending on, I guess, which way you go, I've looked it up. Some say it's 130, some say it's 160. We'll just go with 150, okay? Um, and, and if he and his party were on foot, uh, it means it would have taken about two weeks to walk that. That would be like me walking from my house in Lawrenceburg to Bowling Green, Kentucky. That's commitment. Some churchgoers won't even drive across town for Bible study if it's raining. Some of us use every excuse we can not to make it to church or to help a brother and sister. Again, I don't say any of this in dispersion. Uh, we're just being honest about where we are. Maybe Saul would not have marched those two weeks to Damascus if his third cousin was having a birthday party for their kid that Sunday. Yes, of course he would have. Paul was committed. In verse 2, it says that he was looking for any man or woman belonging to the way. The way is how the early church was known before the term of Christianity came to be. The name the way means that Christianity, Christianity is more than a belief or a set of opinions or doctrines. Following Jesus is a way of living as well as a way of believing. And here was Saul... Apparently, there was enough of our brothers and sisters in Damascus for Saul to be concerned with. So he traveled there with a purpose. But just as Paul is nearing Damascus, his whole life has changed. Not his commitment, just the direction of it. Verse 
verses 3 through 6 describe that uh, suddenly there was a light that shone down around him. And we know from chapter 22 uh, that this would have been about noon, so midday. So for a light to come down and be so bright that you're thrown to the ground and blinded, that had to be something pretty big, right? Something pretty miraculous. And Jesus says to him, Saul, Saul. By the way, anytime you see in Scripture where Jesus repeats himself, he's saying, hey, pay attention. I'm about to tell you something important, right? So Saul, Saul. Now this is also, too, after the resurrection of Christ and his ascension into heaven. So then how could Saul be persecuting Jesus? Remember in Matthew when Jesus said, and as much as you have done it to the least of these, you have done it to me. So how are you treating Jesus? Then Jesus tells Saul to rise up and to go into the city and he would be told what to do. Do we blindly follow Jesus? Would you blindly follow Jesus? Or do you need to see the whole plan first? Or does it need to be your way before you can commit to doing something for Jesus? So Saul went into the city, and for three days he was without sight and neither ate or drank. Saul was shook. There's a, a story of a man that calls his friend and tells him that he can't meet him because he's been hit by a Mack truck. So the friend rushes down to the hospital, but then sees his friend in the parking lot looking just fine. And he asked a question, did that friend really... Was he really affected by something that would be potentially incredibly transformative? Meeting the Lord is transformative. Uh, there's a quote from uh, Luke Walker uh, that's been going around on social media as of late. Uh, it says, the sun will burn your eyes out from a distance of 92 million miles away. Do you expect to casually stroll into the presence of its maker? So Paul here, we see, was transformed. Lifted up from his hate and put on a new path, Paul's world was just completely rocked. But even so, he was obedient. Sometimes that obedience uh, of following Christ looks like in your mind that you have no choice but to follow Christ. You have to keep moving. You have to keep going. You have to serve. You have to teach. You have to pray. You have to help, right? Because you are compelled to. Then in verses 10 to 12, Jesus speaks to a disciple named Ananias and tells him to go to Saul that he may regain his sight. And Ananias has a very human response. He says, Lord, are you sure? But what are you asking me to do? You want me to do what? But Lord, Saul is dangerous. Lord, Saul is against us. Surely you don't want me to go and help him. But Jesus tells Ananias, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And Paul does suffer. And he suffers mightily for the cause of Christ. We can find in 2 Corinthians 11 a picture of some of very much how he suffered. Paul says, but whatever anyone else dares to boast of, and I am speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Adam, Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. Again, the man did not lack confidence. And I'm talking like a madman with far greater labors far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, often near death. Five times I received at the hand of the Jews, 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. And night and day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night in hunger and thirst, often without food, 
in cold and exposure, and apart from all the other things, there is the daily pressure on me for my anxieties for all the church. All of those are far greater excuses than any of us have not to be committed. A fraction of that, uh, I would dare to say, would probably have some churchgoers give up. Christianity is something that we commit ourselves to. And Christian, we commit ourselves to a risen Savior who literally died for us. Or we do not. Commitment is not fractional. It is not sometimes. It is not, well, part of the way. Or, okay, I'll serve, but only if I like what I'm doing as long as nothing else comes along that I can spend my time in. And if you're sitting here agreeing with me, that's awesome. Let's look at how we can do more together. If you're not agreeing with me and you're thinking, is this guy talking about me? Maybe. If you think that sounds hard, yes. Christianity, true Christianity, is tough. It's fighting the good fight. It's running the race. It's about counting it all joy when you suffer or are persecuted. But it has a fantastic retirement plan. After Saul's conversion, he became known to those uh, he, he preached to as Paul. Uh, so Saul was his Hebrew name. Uh, and as he becomes the preacher to the Gentiles, he you know, goes by his, his Greek name, Paul. But Saul and Paul, it's the same guy. Um, in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, uh, Paul describes himself this way. He says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, inclu including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Then in Ephesians 4, Paul starts with, I therefore a prisoner of the Lord. So maybe you think that that kind of commitment only applies to ministers. Well, you'd be right. But listen where Paul's going with this. Uh, spoiler alert, you guys are, are ministers. Paul says, I therefore a prisoner of the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. And then go down to verse 11. It says, And he, the Lord, gave to his people the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints... That's you. The work for ministry. What does that mean? It means if you belong to Christ, you are in ministry. Therefore, if you are not in ministry, how do you belong to Christ? I'm not saying it's what you have to do for a living, but every one of us has a ministry. Every one of us has a mission field. It could be the classroom. It could be your office. It could be at the grocery store. You have a mission field. Everybody knows somebody that needs to hear about the Lord. Everybody knows somebody that needs some type of help that you can give something of yourself to in the name of the Lord. Being a, being a servant of Christ is not something you do. It's who you are. And you either are or you are not. You do it because you are bound to it. That's the whole point of being a bondservant to Christ. God is either your top priority or he is not. Anything you put before the Lord is an idol. We are called to serve the Lord and continue to, to be a servant consistently, continually, not just when it's convenient. If we let every little thing become an excuse to not be here or to not serve or to not be what we should, then being a Christ follower is simply not your priority. Let me close with... Uh, with this from uh, Peter. Peter gives, a, 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 for, the, for the most part, an endorsement of what all Paul is saying. Uh, this will be from 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, but you, guys, you, 
are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. So whatever your ministry is, do it great. Do it like that's your actual purpose on this earth. Like God puts you here at this time and this place for that very reason. Because he did. All right. That's it. Uh, I told you I wouldn't be long, but thank you for bearing with me. We'll see Tim next week. So we'll have uh, the much more talented people come up and sing to you now or sing with us. I love you guys.